Good morning, my name is Andrew de Bloch, and I am the AV Tourism Project Manager at BirdLife South Africa. I hope you enjoyed our opening ceremony and that you will enjoy the rest of the day. Please do remember to visit our virtual exhibition booths as well as peruse and bid on our over 50 silent auction items. Africa is a largely underappreciated continent for birding, despite it having an incredible amount of to offer in terms of birding and wildlife experiences. As we heard from Professor Peter Ryan in the opening address, Africa is second only to South America in terms of overall diversity, with around a quarter of all the world's birds found here, and almost 2,000 of these are continental endemics, meaning that they are found nowhere else in the world. African birding trips typically involve visiting otherwise unexplored places, embracing the true African experience, and getting to grips with the people and cultures that you encounter along the way. The Virtual African Bird Fair is held for all bird lovers and birders in Africa, as well as those who would like to visit here. With this in mind, it makes sense to kick off our events for the day in earnest, by highlighting some of the special places and birds in Africa. Here to take you on a whistle-stop tour through African birding destinations are 10 speakers split across two sessions. This first session will feature six destinations, all presented by professional tour guides. We will not have a question and answer session, but instead ask you to rather note down their contact details at the end of their talks, as well as visit their exhibition booths to interact with them and find out more about these destinations and more. This session features Johnny Kamugisha speaking on Uganda, John Kinghorn of Expedition Birding speaking on Namibia, Etienne Murray of Indicator Birding on Mozambique, Michael Mills of Birding Africa and Go Away Birding presenting on Angola, Dr. Dominic Rowlinson of Birding Eco Tours on Ethiopia, and Mark Crenier of Nature Travel on Ghana. Please enjoy this first session focusing on African birding destinations. Uh, good day, everyone. This is Johnny from Uganda, who is going to give you a presentation today about uh, birding in Uganda. <coughs> <clears throat> Uganda is one beautiful country. And uh, welcome to my presentation. My name is Johnny Kamjisha and I'm going to take you through a thrilling and very rewarding experience. Uganda is a very small country, almost the size of the United Kingdom, as you can see there. 260, 40 kilometers squared. And that is the land, and you can see the size of the water. Uh, Uganda's highest point is on top of the Renzori Mountains, the snow-capped Renzori Mountains, which is 5,109 meters above sea level. And uh, the lowest point is in Murchison at uh, 620 meters above sea level. Uganda sits on the equator, and so our temperature is almost the same. The average is between 18 and 28 degrees Celsius. Now, because of uh, the birding fair, I'll take you to a few birding spots in Uganda because I don't have enough time to take you through because Uganda has 10 national parks and 12 wildlife reserves. But usually when we do our birding, we start at this point known as Mabamba Swamp, popularly known for its, its shoebill, this bird you are looking at. 
But while there, you can see several other birds like this blue swallow, which I photographed there, lots of pipe kingfishers, the papyrus dweller, the blue headed cuckoo, lots of uh, ducks, gulls, herons, and lots more. Usually, it's our beginning where we start our trip from. And I'll take you to Murchison, one of the most powerful falls in the world. We get lots of birds there, and at some point we've started getting southern common bee eaters. You can see this is a northern common bee eater. We've got lots of red-throated bee eaters there. Other countries have got cardinals, but we have bishops. This is the northern red bishop that we see up at Murchison. Abyssinian uh, ground hornbill. Saddlebill stalk, Huglings, Francolin. At Murchison, you can get the Shoebill as well. I love this photograph. This was uh, a lapwing fighting the secretary bird. And then we've got, you call them, uh, um, we call them Denham's Bastard. And uh, when we're in Murchison, we don't only see birds but we see other mammals as well this is a patas monkey that you'll find up north where Murchison is found and probably in Kidepo this is still Murchison lots of birds swallowtail beater marshall eagle gray kestrel gray eagle owl batalua you will get lions there giraffes and lots more like I said that when we are there we don't only see birds but we see lots of other mammals as well. Now I'll take you to Bwindi which is uh, one popular place in the whole world. It's the only place or the only national park where you will find gorillas living with chimpanzees. You cannot find it anywhere else in the world. Bwindi is an important birding area. It has got 23 Albert and Rift endemics because it's found in the Rift Valley in the Albert and region. And here I gave you a few of the Albert and Rift endemics that we find in Bwindi. You can see the Rigo soundbird there, yellow-eyed black flycatcher, this is a grass broadbill, popularly known as African green broadbill. He uses this moss to build a nest. It's usually green, which looks like it. The bird itself is green, so if you're not careful, you may not know how to find that bird. Then there is a dusky crimson wing. Then there is Grenzoria palis, it used to be known as Colada palis. We've got red faced warbler, one small bird, but interesting, or is calling. Archer's robin chart is another Albert and Rift endemic that we find in Windy. Stripe breasted teeth, which is being researched on at Rohesia. Rohesia, Windy has got four different sectors where you go to see gorillas and where we go bird watching as well. So these ones are being researched on at one of the sectors known as Rhodesia. We've got the strange weaver that we find there as well and we've got the Renzori batis. Those are a few of the 23 Albert and Rift endemics that we find in Windy. And Windy is one small national park but very good for bird watching. That's where we find this uh, fine banded woodpecker. It's not an Albert and Rift endemic, but you find it there, which is uh, known as toolbox woodpecker as well, if you want it. So in Bindi, you could be able to find in about two, three birding days, you should be able to find at least 200 bird species there that you may not find in other places. 
Some of them are these. The black billed weaver, black billed turaco, because African wood, wood, wood owl will be seen there. The Oreo finch, which looks like an Oreo, like a mini Oreo, is found there. You'll find it in Bindi and uh, Mugahinga. I've got a South African friend actually called Patrick Cadwell. He loves this turaco, the great blue turaco. You will not miss that one. Now, the grass broadbill that I showed you in the nest is this very bird here. Black bee eater, you'll see them in other places, but you will not miss them in Windy. I love trogons. This is a bartel trogon, which you will find in Windy as well. And like I said, all our national parks, we've got different uh, types of uh, national parks or habitats, but most of them are savanna, and then we have forests, and of course we bird on water bodies as well. So like I said, Windy has got gorillas and chimpanzees, and several other primates, like this loist monkey. Now, we've got two flycatchers in Windy, and if you don't know how to differentiate them, you may not be able to. This one you can find in most parts of the country, which is African blue flycatcher. But this one is a regional endemic, which is a white-tailed blue flycatcher. You will find it only in the southern part of the country. This one is a variable sunbird, one beautiful bird, which almost looks like the regal sunbird here. And if you are into butterflies, you will find lots of butterflies to enjoy down at Bindi. I thought I would show you the transport we use to take you around from place to place. Like I said, we have 10 national parks. So we use these kinds of vehicles to transport you, pick you from the airport, depending on the days you have on your sleeves, we will design an itinerary basing on that. It could be 14 days, it could be 18 days, it could be 21 days, depending on what you want. And we will drive you in these through the parks, Murchison, Chibale, Queen Elizabeth, Bindi, Lake Mburo, some other forests, Semliki, Budongo. We've got one beautiful park in the northeastern called Kidepo. You could visit that as well so that you enjoy lots of that and at the end of it you would love to come back again these are not uh his excellency ramaphosa's cows but these are known as ankole longhorn cattle you would be able to see them if you come to uganda and you happen to go to a national park known as Lake Mburu because that is in Ankole where these cows are kept and you would enjoy them indeed. Since I don't have more than 10 minutes, I will end my presentation here and I thank you very much for giving me the time to give you this presentation and so I'll show you a bit of Uganda so that you think about coming to Uganda and I look forward to seeing you all in the Pearl of Africa. That's how Uganda is known. To the 2020 African Bird Fair. My name is John Kinghorn. I'm extremely humbled and extremely excited to be able to chat to you all today about a topic which is very, very dear to my heart, a country which is very, very dear to my heart and one which I absolutely love visiting over and over again. I was there at the beginning of this year, just before lockdown, and we had an absolutely fantastic time. Uh, me and a friend went up to go and switch a Ross's to Rocco, and we also spent time in the infamous Caprivi Strip, looking for some local gems over there, which I'm gonna be chatting a little bit more about going forward. Let's get into the thick of it though. So, Namibia, right? Namibia is fantastic. It is about 825,000 400 kilometers squared okay so it's a pretty pretty large country what i've done here is i have uh 
giving you sort of a nice context in terms of where on the continent it is. For those of you who are tuning in from different parts of the world, its old name, uh, its old name was Southwest Africa um, before it became independent. And uh, as you can see, that's given because of its location. It is literally in the southwestern bottom part of the African continent. Uh, there's about a population of two and a half million people just shy of two and a half million people. So not, not many people actually um, for that sort of kilometer square inch. Namibia is extremely popular uh, for many reasons. And I'm just gonna list a couple of them here. It's easy to travel in. The network of roads is fantastic. Even when we get into semi sort of uh, rural parts or extremely isolated parts of Namibia, it is still very, very travel. You, you're able to travel there um, with relative ease. So it's fantastic in that regard. Uh, it's got interchangeable currency in South Africa. So if ever you wanna find out what the Namibian dollar is, although it's still called the Namibian dollar, it is essentially the same as a rand. So if you have South African rands or you've just come from a South African tour or something like that, or you're a local based South African, you can use that freely in Namibia. English is the official language. Even though Namibia has over 30 different languages, Nam uh, English is still the official language. And along the coast, there's still a lot of German that is spoken. Um, obviously it was a German colony. So yeah, German is still a very, very popular language in the country. So if you know German or if you are German, you're good off. It is also relatively safe. Uh, it's not, you know, a lot of people complain about African countries uh, and their safety. One of the first questions people ask is, oh, is that country safe? Uh, and yes, well, Namibia is relatively safe. Obviously, whenever you are, wherever you are, whenever you are there, it is important to make sure that you are aware of your safety. Uh, crime is all over the world, unfortunately, no matter where we go. So, um, but I think in the bigger scheme of things, Namibia is certainly relatively safe. And of course, it has very friendly people. You can go to Namibia, everybody's generally smiling and greeting you. And it is a very, very pleasant, pleasant country to travel. I'm just going to take you through a couple of my favorite spots and some of the more popular spots, um, you know, people would visit as birders and biodiversity lovers in Namibia. And we're going to start on the central western uh, coast, which is basically still part of the Namib Narklift National Park. Uh, the Namib Desert is the world's oldest desert, which is just, just over 55 million years old. And it's about 2,000 or over 2,000 kilometers in length and it runs up the whole west coast um well this southern western coast um, of the continent and over three different countries so from angola to namibia and then a little bit into south africa as well so we spend a lot of time around walvis bay and swakopmund area and we look for a couple of things there the walvis bay area is actually a ramsar um recognized wetland area so obviously with those words, we know it's going to be brilliant, brilliant birding. And uh, it is brilliant birding. We also spend a lot of time when we aren't around the, the coast there, looking in the salt marshes or looking for waders or various other birds that are hanging around there. We then go off into um, the Namib itself. And we look for the two uh, larks there. Namibia is only true endemic to date, uh, the dune lark. And then we also look for a, another very, very sought after near endemic, the Grays lark. And that's where we spend most of it. Here's a nice scenic picture of a dune just south of where I had located on the map in Sources Flay, another spot where we tend to look for dune lock as well. Um, Namibia has some of the highest dunes in the world and Sources Flay is certainly one of those spots where a lot of people love to go and climb a dune and watch the sunset and it is actually really really remarkable to see. Now in Walvis Bay and Swakopmund um, it's probably one of the most concentrated populations of chestnut banded plover. Um, it's fantastic, fantastic photographic opportunities for chestnut banded plover and uh, it's definitely a little highlight. Other various wetland type birds um, are popular as well. Great white pelican is fantastic and then of course star him or herself 
the stunning little dune lock. A lot of the times, these guys are pretty confiding and they'll scurry a mere meters away from you across the crests of dunes. And uh, it's really, really special, um, this little bird. I have to go through these sites a little bit quicker than, than I would have hoped for. Unfortunately, there's many, many exciting things on the roster for the African Bird Fair today. So uh, I hope you guys will just get a nice little teaser taster from this talk and uh, you can contact me as well for more information, any questions and whatever the case might be. Um, but yeah, I tend to babble quite a lot like now. <laughs> so um, the next area is a place called Brandberg or Aus. It's near the town of Aus. And also fantastic, you're still in this very, very arid central parts of Namibia. And here the birds are an attraction but a lot of people come here for the elephants um, and I would advise not wearing orange t-shirts like yours truly in this photograph. Unfortunately, I'd just woken up so that was probably one of the only shirts that I had nearby so I threw that on quickly when these elephants were passing through. And this is just our normal Loxodonta Africana um, African elephants and these oaks just reckon that they dig the desert life and uh you know there's nothing that they, they, they're not they don't really fancy vast quantities of water like their low felt cousins um so yeah these guys not a separate subspecies or anything like that they're our stock standard african elephant but it's just really a treasure a treasurable sight seeing these elephants cruise uh through this extremely barren and harsh landscape one of the stars, avian-wise, is the Damara red-billed hornbill, which was uh, split off of southern red-billed hornbill. It's fantastic. It's very pale in the face in comparison to its southern red-billed cousin. And it is also one of the uh, highly sought after near-endemics of Namibia. White-tailed shrike. Uh, a lot of people refer to this little dude as a Kaoka ground batis. Kaoka being one of the regions in Namibia and ground batis because it looks like a batis uh, that cruises around on the ground and in the low-hanging foliage um, of you know the trees, the thornfeld scrub and that that they, that they live in. Fantastic, fantastic animals. Another highly sought after near endemic. Tony, every time I see this picture, Tony absolutely nailed this picture. Um, but what a bird. Absolutely love them. Full of charisma and uh, very, very special to see. Another picture of Arupal's Quran. Um, these guys are in good numbers when we're in Central, uh, Central America. When we're in Central Namibia uh, and we, we get them full up generally. So absolutely love them. Very, very um, stunning Kohan and they blend blend in so well with with the landscape as you can see here um, they blend in absolutely fantastically. Starks Lock, Namibia is known, well, central Namibia, central southern Namibia are known for their LBJs much like the northern Cape region of South Africa and Starks Lock is one of those locks or LBJs that uh, we also um, spend a lot of time looking for very pale lark, nice conical, thick shaped bill, and a very, I want to say, very thin, out of proportion type head, um, neck and head area. Fantastic little bird, and their little pink legs, and um, yeah, fantastic bird. Love them. Moving into Itosha, Itosha is, to, is obviously one of the world's most famous uh, national parks. It's fantastic. It's got big game, lions, leopards, elephants. We see all of them and it's, it's fantastic spending time there. I love the scenic shots of a blue crane as he's cruising in the vast expanse of the pan. And of course, uh, some of the camps are extremely popular. Violet wood hoopoe and this bare cheeked babbler. You can see why it gets its name just on its cheek area there or around its ear. Um, it's bare, it has no feathers. Bare cheeked babbler, one of Namibia's many, many, like I said at the beginning of this talk, uh, highly sought after near endemics. Double banded courses tend to be rather confiding as well. This individual came, uh, there was a point where it was, it was too close for my camera. And fantastic, fantastic, fantastic opportunities. Hands down are the best place to see them in the world. And Itasha in some years is fantastic for Birchall's Corsa. Um, which is obviously this little dude's more sought after cousin. Then we move up. That one's not all that accurate. I just had to put it there because it wouldn't have fit on the PowerPoint if I didn't. But that's the Kunani region of Namibia. Fantastic, fantastic place. 
and one of my favorite places in, in, in the country itself. You go onto this river rhino oasis um, on the border of Angola, and you go here really for three birds. Uh, Rufus tailed palm thrush, Angola, uh, four birds. Rufus tailed palm thrush, Angola cave, chat cinderella waxbill, gray kestrel. So it's a canary four that you go for. And uh, if you go in the right time of the year, September's probably best when the rains haven't come and it's still quite dry. And that way the Cindy, the Cindy's, as they call them locally, will come down to a single puddle to drink. You know, the only available water source that there is at that time of the year. Uh, you can get to the Angola cave chats with relative ease. You can't go there once it's rained. It's not even possible in a four by four. Uh, and the great kestrels, well, the great kestrels are there year round and the Rufus Town palm thrushes are breeding in the uh, breeding in the, the lodge grounds itself, and there is Mr. Rufus tailed palm thrush. Moving through to the Devundu area of Namibia, here we target another three very special birds: Rufus belly tit, as you can see here, um, probably one of the easier birds to get in that region, in that part of the country, I would think. And this guy, Susa's shrike. Susa Shrike, thanks Peter Schultz for the picture by the way. Susa Shrike, I love seeing these guys, they're fantastic. Um, they're a Miombu specialist and uh, they're, just, oof, they're just brilliant. I absolutely love them. Um, yeah, uh, really, really fantastic, fantastic birds. They enjoy these trees um, which are very, very spaced out with sort of degraded woodland beneath it. So they're very much a degraded woodland specialist. Um, yeah, degraded Miombu type, Brachistifia woodland. Um, fantastic, fantastic birds, I love them. And then the further you move east into the Caprivi strip of Namibia, you get even more of a contrast of landscape. You've come from arid, arid, arid central uh, Namibia, and you end up going into this oasis-like place, and you'll see the pictures coming forward. Bradfield Hornbill. Bradfield's Hornbill is one we get generally in transit. Fantastic little Hornbills, love them. And of course, we then get to the main rivers. You end up getting the Kavango River coming in after having made its way all the way down from uh, the Angola. And then you get the Zambezi that comes in as well. And of course, with these major rivers comes major bird life as well, and animal life and uh, photographic opportunities about. Um, between the Kavango River, which ultimately leads into the Okavango Delta in Botswana and the Panhandle in Northern Namibia, um, you then move across into the Strip uh, where you've got the Zambezi and you're on the banks of the Zambezi. African fish eagle, absolutely stunning. Uh, Alan's gallinule as well. Uh, one of the specialists we target here, two of them actually, Lesa Jakana, don't have a picture of them yet one day. Uh, and another one is, Alan, uh, is uh, Greater Swamp Warbler as well. Also fantastic birds, um, which we keep our eyes for. Greater Swamp Warbler being a papyrus specialist. This guy, obviously the most sought after bird on many a birders uh, wish list, Pearl's Fishing Owl. Love, love, love Pearl's Fishing Owl. And this Caprivi strip area in the Okavangu Panhandle and the Okavangu itself are probably one of the best places in the world to see Pearl's Fishing Owl. Um, there's very, very high concentrations of these birds there. I'm not saying go there and expect flocks of pearls fishing hours busy frantically fishing um that's not the case although we wish it would be um no rather these guys are still as elusive and as secretive but uh, a lot of the guys keep good tabs on them and therefore we have very very good uh success rate in terms of connecting with pearls fishing hours cracking views of african skimmers coming right past the boat um these fantastic bulls that they've got these lower mandibles, um, which they use to sort of plow up the fish as they skim the water so expertly. Um, they give us fantastic, fantastic photographic opportunity. And of course, the eastern part of the Caprivi Strip is well known for Charlo's Taraka. Uh, stunning, stunning garden birds, very mournful, harsh type call um, you hear in the mornings. And in the lodges we stay at, they come down to the feeders and the bird baths. So you can enjoy um, equally fantastic views of these birds. Stunning, stunning with the long, 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 long crest, um, white-tipped crest. 
And like I said, the visuals, you know, you had, if you can think back to the beginning of this presentation, where we had uh, the very, very um, arid dune that I gave you, showed you a picture of from Sources Flay. And then you get this, this taken on the uh, Kavangu River. And what a sunset. You, you, can't, you can't beat this. Listen, a picture can only do so much justice. But uh, actually being there and just after a cracking day's birding, skimmers coming past you, fish eagles, it's just it's something else. It really, really is something else. And that is that. Unfortunately, my time is up. I would have loved to have spoken more about this fantastic country, one of our favorite destinations to visit, one of, our, uh, one of the world's most popular destinations in terms of um, birding and biodiversity. A lot of people are looking at traveling to Namibia from abroad because it's a very, very nice introduction to African birding, Namibia and South Africa. So uh, yeah, that's, that's it. I could talk more about it, but I can't. My time is up. I hope you will enjoy the rest of the African Bird Fair, the 2020 virtual bird fair. I think it's fantastic. Well done, Bird Life South Africa. And thank you for watching and for taking your time out to uh, give appreciation to the amazing work that the Bird Life South Africa has put in terms of making this year's bird fair possible in these very interesting COVID times. Thank you, everybody. I'm John Kinghorn from Expedition Birding. Feel free to get into contact with us. Keep safe. Bird hard. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Etienne Marais. I've been running birding tours into Mozambique for the last 15 years and to date, I think I've done about 60 trips there. Uh, we've only got 10 minutes, so I'm gonna go through quickly and tell you about some of the highlights of this wonderful part of the world. So to start off with, just to say thank you to a whole variety of people who've assisted with photographs um, over the years. Uh, I'm not a photographer, so these are photographs from friends and clients. Mozambique is a huge country, just about 3,000 k's from north to south, but we're only going to be dealing with that area south of the Zambezi River, which falls into the Southern African listing area. And we start in the south near Maputo, just north of the city, is Makaneta, uh, an area on the Umkamati River, just north of the Umkamati River, there's this huge wetland areas which has really become quite famous recently. Apart from common species like yellow-throated longclaw and uh, bl uh, black-throated waterline, it's become famous for one of the big local twitches. The man in the middle is Gary Allport, who lived there for eight years in Maputo and discovered quite a few uh, new birds for the Southern African list, including this one, the sharp-tailed sandpiper. Only two records for Africa to date, and we await for their return sometime in October this year. A lot of Mozambique is unexplored. There's lots of exciting places to visit. This is Lake Sakativa on the Limpopo floodplain, a vast lake literally covered with African pygmy geese. To the north, a well-known area is the Panda Miombo woodlands, which are famous for olive-headed weaver and a variety of other specials, including racquetailed roller and masquerine martin in winter. And is it far? No, it's really not far. If you take that as the Kruger Park and you look at where it is, it's literally between the Kruger Park and Inamban, about 70 kilometers inland from the town of Inharim. So this is known for this very interesting mist, uh, mist watered uh, woodlands, which is very diverse and it has fantastic bird parties and is characterized by this lichen or usnia, which grows on the trees. Um, and olivetted weaver, this is the world distribution map, is only found a little bit in, in Tanzania, uh, Malawi, and the, the southernmost spot is the Panda Woodlands, where they still exist in numbers. The most beautiful weaver, sometimes hard to find. This was in February, where we lucked upon a nest with male and female taking turns to build. Other specials of the woodlands include racquetailed roller, this lovely uh, red-faced crombeck, and nearby the, um, uh, the wetlands in the, in the area around Panda hold things like rosy-throated longclaw, great bittern, Dickinson's kestrel, and others. So now we're going to head a little bit further north 
in 2013, Hugh Chittenden and Greg Davies rediscovered the long lost green tinkerbird. And this area is basically towards just to the north of Inamban, where the blue arrow is pointing. It's called the Ungwana Woodlands. And it's a, it's a type of coastal thicket. Um, a lot of its big trees have been cut down, but they're emergent baobab trees. And this is the place where we have the green tinkerbird, smaller than our other tinkerbirds and hard to find. And it seems that since then, um, more spots nearby have also been discovered. Then we go across to the coast. The Indian barn area is characterized by this vast uh, estuary, Indian barn estuary, Praia de Barra, fantastic for waders, um, particularly the crab plover, sometimes seen on the beach there. But you can also do pelagic trips and you're bound to bump into greater frigate bird or in winter, large numbers of humpback whales displaying. And then inland, um, uh, some very nice wetlands called the Lagoas. You can visit Gary Rowan at his lodge and go looking for great bittern in those wetlands in that area. Another really good special here is the African hobby, which breed in the area quite widespread in southern Mozambique. So we're heading north across the Pungwe River, north of Beira, the National Gorongosa National Park and Mount Gorongosa just to the north. Mount Gorongosa is a is an ancient volcanic uh, outcrop with has which has remnant Afromontane forest on it. Uh, not not able one is not able to visit at the moment due to sec security concerns, but we trust that it'll be open up to birders uh, fairly soon. Um, you have to travel up the mountain, up track, and then walk the last uh, short distance up to the forest on the slopes of the upper mountain. And this is really some of the finest Afromontane forest in Southern Africa. Really spectacular. And of course, made famous by this race of green-headed oriole with the white spot, which occurs there nowhere else in Southern Africa. But while you're there, you may encounter other good birds like the black and white flycatcher, that was the female, um, moustache grass warbler and others like bronze nape pigeon, eastern sawwing, airs eagle and even lesser seed cracker if you're lucky. The park itself is well worth visiting. This is one of the most beautiful parks in Africa with a spectacular Lake Urema uh, being its centerpiece. Then we go back down to the coast, follow the Pungwe River at Beira. Just north of Beira, amazing graph flooded areas hold all sorts of really mouth-watering birds like blue quail, wattle crane, locust finch, uh, and a great bittern. So just down the bottom here of this image near Beira, Rear Savang Wetlands, that's where we're talking about. Saddleville Stork, Wattle Crane, I've seen a flock of 42 there a couple of years ago. And then of course the enigmatic and difficult to see locust finch hidden in the grass there. And there's a flight shot of a flight, the male flying above. And then uh, one of uh, difficult species like great snipe are regular there in summer. And if you're lucky, you'll bump into lesser seed cracker. And if you're lucky, you'll see the great bittern, which does breed their numbers when conditions are good. Here's uh, a shocking image of an incredibly difficult bird to photograph, the blue quail, which can also be common there at times. Mangrove swamps on the coast hold mangrove kingfishers, of course, in numbers. And there's a famous pair of bat hawk in the village on the outskirts of Beira, which have been there for 10 years and are very tame. So then we head north to the Katadas, the legendary Katadas, Katadas in the area around Pingue Lodge. And this is an area of hunting concessions, and but we include also Zambezi uh, around Kaya and up at Sena and other parts of the area. So if you look at this map, you're looking basically at the Zambezi coming in there, you're looking at a Pingue, and then you're looking in, in towards the coast, all these hunting concessions. These are vast areas. Katada 12 is 120,000 hectares. And the, the, the place to visit here, of course, is in Pingwe Lodge, one of the most popular stops in Mozambique. There are wild dog in the area, believe it or not, in the Inamitanga Forest Reserve, which one accesses along a public road. And these days you have to arrange to go into Katada 12. The birds here are incredible. African Pitta, White-Chested Alethi, and many others being the, the most um, thought after species in the area. Um, and you have 
attractive birds like the tessin fronted helmet shrike, African pitta in early December, difficult to find but regular, um, Zambezi indigo bird in late summer from late December onwards, black headed apalis in forests on, in the Inner Matunga Forest Reserve, of course, plain black sunbird, which is more widespread, uh, tiny uh, eastern lowland tiny greenbill. Uh, East Coast Akalat, one of the really juicy and beautiful little birds of the forest. And of course, my favorite, white-chested Alethi. And here's the male black and white flycatcher or black and white shrike flycatcher. Really, really cool bird. Has to be the coolest bird in Southern Africa. You can head up to the Zambezi for um, Bums Bee Eater at Senna. And if you're lucky in late summer, you can even bump into this incredible mega, the Basra one of the birds that Trevor Hardacre still hasn't seen. And of course there are new discoveries. Look at the town of Inusoro, just north of, of Villanculos and south of Villanculos, the San Sebastian Peninsula, uh, which is really a spectacular place. So this was in February this year, vast flocks of terns, up to 18,000 terns, uh, Madagascar bee eaters breeding, and of course the new discovery, the Saunders tern along with flocks of Domara. What are they doing there at this time of year? Flocks of Eurasian oyster catchers and sooty tern on the beach. So that's, that's it all for now uh, in Mozambique. That's the Forbes Watson Swift, the newest bird on the Southern African list. And we look forward to seeing in Mozambique soon. Good morning, fellow birders. Thanks for tuning in for my talk on birding in Angola, which I'm presenting in association with Birding Africa. My involvement with Angola began in 2003 when I traveled to the country for a week to assess the bird ecotourism potential. And since 2005, I've visited regularly to conduct various bird research and conservation projects. I've also lived in Luanda for three years and I've traveled extensively through the country and know its birds intimately. In order to understand the great diversity of birds and the bird distribution patterns in Angola, it helps to know a little about, about the physical template on which the biodiversity has evolved. One of these elements is altitude, and there are four main altitudinal elements to Angola. Firstly, there's a narrow coastal plain which runs along the entire west coast, lying below 300 meters altitude. Most of the country is covered in an inland plateau above 1,000 meters. Then the two most interesting elements from a biodiversity point of view are the, Afrima, the highlands above 2,000 meters, which hold the most isolated Afro-Montane elements on the continent, and the escarpment, which runs at the interface between the coastal plain and the inland plateau, which varies in steepness and width significantly, significantly. in the north. It's uh, a gradual rise across a wide range, and in the center and south, a very steep change in altitude. Rainfall also varies dramatically across the country. In the southwest, there's some very dry conditions with under 100 millimeters of rain per year, up to the northeast where the average is over 1,500 meters. The highland areas are also a very important source of water for many of the big rivers in Southern Africa. Uh, some water drains into the Zambezi, the Okavango, and the Kaneni systems. This variety in physical template has resulted in a wide range of habitats or ecoregions, varying from the Namib Desert in the southwest up to the Congo Basin forests of Kabinda and also a significant Congo Basin forest in the northeast. Most of the country is covered in rich Miombo woodland, the grey, and some drier woodlands in the south. However, the two most important and significant elements are the Afromontane elements here, grassland and forests, very small patches of forest, and the escarpment elements, which are linked to the Congo Basin forests, uh, but a drier version of them. And this is a look from, look at Angola from a satellite image. The things I would like to point out again are the escarpment here, which has these moist dark green forests associated with them, surrounded by dry habitats. And then in the southeast, you can see all the rivers draining out here into the Zambezi, the Okavango, and the, and the Kanene systems. 
So I'll now take you through an overview of our standard bird watching tour, which we've developed over a long period. And uh, we start off in Luanda, travel northeast to the northern escarpment, then southeast onto the plateau into the Miombo woodlands at Kalandula, back west to the base of the central escarpment before we continue on down the coast into the arid habitats of the south. Our southernmost point is at Rubango, where we visit the highland areas and also the dry coast nearby. And then we return to Luanda via Mount Moko and Kumbira Forest before returning to Luanda. And I'll now take you through that in more detail. So as I mentioned, we started off in the northern, we start off in the northern escarpment where there's rich Congo Basin forests. Most of the birds here are Congo Basin species, but there are also a couple of endemics, including the very striking bronze bush shrike and the less striking but very interesting Angolan white-throated greenbull. This is the first photograph ever of the bird taken in the wild. From here we move east to Kalandula Falls, which has a mosaic of Miombo woodland and gallery forests. The Miombo woodland holds some great birds such as Anketa's barbet and sharp-tailed starling, but it's in the gallery forest that the true champion or hero is found in this very striking white-headed robin chat is endemic to northern Angola and adjacent DRC. So this is the best place in the world to see this beautiful species. We then move towards the central escarpment, specifically to the base of the central escarpment where there's dry forest and thickets with a surprisingly large number of endemics to be seen. This is Grey Strike Franklin, which is fairly widespread along the escarpment, but this is the easiest area in which to see it. White-fronted wattle line is uh, unobtrusive in the thickets in the area. This is a striking little Gabella helmet shrike, very closely related to Ritz's helmet shrike, but smaller and you can see much paler gray on the body and especially on the mantle contrasting with the wings. Montero's bush shrike is fairly common here, very similar to gray-headed bush shrike but with these pale spectacles. This is the striking little golden back bishop, which unfortunately is not in breeding plumage at the best time for general bird watching in Angola. So we don't normally see it in this plumage. And two of the more dowdy but widespread endemics, red back mouse bird and bubbling cysticula, both of which are common here, but can even be seen in Luanda. We then move down the coast. The entire coastline is quite arid. Uh, but the Bengala area is the northern tip of where one can see many of the Namibian escarpment birds and also even some of the Namib desert birds. Uh, there are no endemics here, but a whole bunch of specials, including Hartlips Franklin, White-tailed Shrike, and Rock Runner. We then move on to the Lubango area, which is the far southern end of our loop. Lubango is situated in the highlands at around 2,000 meters altitude and here we visit montane grasslands and aframontane forests uh, with beautiful rocky areas around. At, this is mainly at Tundavala, where it's easy to see Angola cave chat, strictly speaking, and the endemic. Angola's sui waxpool, similar to our sui waxpool, but with heavily, a heavily barred back and more extensive yellow underparts. And Angola's last rediscovered endemic white belly barbet, which is confined to a very small area associated with the southern escarpment. We also do a day trip down into the coastal deserts of Namib uh, and running from Lubango at over 2000 meters. It's an incredible transect through ever dry habitat, starting off at the base of the escarpment with species such as Cinderella waxball, bare cheek babbler, and this Bengilla long-tailed starling and moving into the very dry desert where you see things like Rupal's Quran and Track Track Chat. From Lubango, we then start our journey back north to Luanda, and we spend three full days in the very rich Mount Moko region. Mount Moko itself has some of the most important patches of Afromontane forest in the country, surrounded by montane grassland, but most of the area is covered in moist Miombo woodland with these broad grassy 
drainage lines or dam burrs running through them. And this area presents a very wide range of special birds. Firstly, there's the endangered endemic Swestris franklin, of which there are about 80 pairs at Mount Mirko, It occurs on forest edge. And Gola Slaty flycatcher, also on forest edge. And Ludwig stubble collared sunbird. Then in the surrounds, one of the top birds is beautiful Bockage's sunbird, which occurs in the Dambos running through Miombo woodland. But there are also many other special birds, including Bockage's weaver, Brothers Martin, and in the bottom right, Huambosa stickler. And Huambosa stickler is Angola's latest or newest endemic species. It was thought to be a subspecies of rock loving cysticula, but uh, we now know that it's completely unrelated. Our final stop of the trip is at Kumbira Forest on the central escarpment, and this is probably the single most important area for birds and bird conservation in Angola. There are three endangered endemics here they are Pulitzer's longbow. Cabela helmet shrike, sorry, Cabela bush shrike. And with the smallest range of all the endemics, Cabela akalat. And all these birds occur in, in fairly dry forest at the top of the escarpment. There are also some other great birds though. This is pale throated barbet endemic to Angola. And the striking red crested turaco, which is widespread along the escarpment, but this is probably the best site at which to see it. So just a brief summary of the journey. It's 18 days in length, plus an arrival day. It starts and ends in Rwanda. In the beginning, our tours were camping tours, but the infrastructure has developed enough that we now offer fully hotel accommodated tours without any camping. And you'll be surprised at how comfortable the accommodation actually is. The tour offers a chance to see all of Angola's endemic birds, and uh, we have a very high success rate of finding these species and a trip total of about 550 species. For anyone interested in going to Angola, this, uh, my book on the special birds of Angola features 70 of the top species, all the endemics, and I'm offering it on a special. If you want a copy, please email me. Finally, thanks to the various people who contributed photographs to this presentation. And if you have any questions uh, regarding Angola, please do drop me an email. Uh, I'll be glad to answer your questions. Okay, thanks very much. Hi, my name is Dominic Ronson. I work for Burning Eco Tours, and I'll be chatting to you today about birding in Ethiopia. So Ethiopia is an incredible African birding destination. Um, probably unlike any other in Africa. It, um, it has a large number of both country endemics and Horn of Africa endemics. And uh, it's these species, these specials that we will be targeting on our birding tours to Ethiopia. However, Ethiopia also has a large number of um, special and impressive animals, particularly mammals, such as Ethiopian wolf, which is shown here. And we'll be searching for um, for a number of these animal for these mammals on our on our bird watching tours. So most tours start off in in uh, Addis Ababa, which is uh, in the centre of the country. It's on the um, central plateau, and uh, we basically we head up north to Debra Lebanos and to Debra Behan, where we um, we bird the along the edge of the escarpment here, and um, heading down into the lowlands of Awash National Park and to Alidege, which is uh, on, on the edge of the um, Danakil Depression and has some of the hottest temperatures on Earth. So we really need to make, uh, make sure we're up early uh, on these days before we head down to the um, to a rift valley where we bird Langano area, up into the Bali Mountains where we search for or we look for Ethiopian wolf, back down into the, um, to the rift valley before heading right down south to Yabelo area, right in the south of, of Ethiopia, where we search for um, Streisman's bush crow and white-tailed swallow. We then make our way back up north through the Rift Valley to Giva Gorge, and we end off in Addis Ababa. So 
just about all tourists to Ethiopia, birding tourists to Ethiopia start in Addis Ababa, where we bird the, the hotel grounds for the um, for a number of uh, endemics, such as um, or at least regional endemics, such as wattled ibis. Uh, there's really nice, nasty um, maintained gardens where we look for Takazi sunbirds. There's a large number of sunbirds around, ground run seed eaters. Uh, banded barbets, particularly if there's fruiting figs around. And then we had, um, once we'd had a little taste of Ethiopian birding, we head north out of the out of the capital and we bird the Saluta Plains. So this is just north of uh, Addis, probably 20, 30 kilometers north of Addis Ababa. And here we bird the plains for things like Abyssinian, Abyssinian longcrawl, Ethiopian cysticla. There's also thick bald ravens in the area. So it's basically these high altitude grasslands which are really heavily Raised. Also things such as blue and goose, another endemic. Uh, White-collared pigeons are um, really abund abundant in these areas. Erlanger's lark, which uh, is a fairly recent split from red-capped lark. And uh, this is groundscaper thrush, so this is the Abyssinian race or subspecies, which is very common up in these areas. And there's large numbers of goats and cattle in the area. And uh, at these um, at these kill or at these um, where animals have been killed, um, there's a large number of scavengers come in, uh, so particularly vultures, such as these ripples vultures, probably about the most common vulture up there. But you also get white-backed vultures around, uh, lots of hooded Egyptian vultures, white-headed vultures, and the occasional lapid-faced vulture too. We head to uh, Debre Libanos, which is on the uh, uh, on the escarpment and overlooks the Blue Nile Valley. Uh, some more impressive birding out here. And we spent, spent quite a bit of time with the gelada baboons, which occur in big troops in the area, uh, sometimes numbering into the hundreds. Um, really impressive animals, also known as bleeding heart baboons, because this patch of, um, patch of uh, bare skin on, its, on their chests and big, uh, big hairy manes. So really good, we often get very good views of these uh, animals up here. And we can sit on the, on the cliffs and have uh, eye level views of some of the vultures. So bearded vulture or lamachai is the big target up there. I wasn't lucky enough to get a photograph of one, but you do get ripples vultures coming by and, and, and other specials. Uh, along the, in, in the general area, we look for ripples black chat, which can be quite cute little birds and quite confiding. In the little patches of forest, such as around the monastery, we search for white-cheeked taraco, Abyssinian catbird is around here too, white-backed black tit, uh, white-billed starlings occur on the cliffs, and we search uh, for also for uh, Abyssinian woodpecker, which can be a fairly tough bird on, on the Ethiopia tour, um, but uh, generally we do pick up one or two. We then head a little bit further east towards Deborah Berhan, and we spend the day in the Gemma Valley uh, for things such as um, for Harwoods and Urkel's Franklin, particularly Harwoods Franklin is the big target here, extremely range restricted uh, Franklin. And we also look for Abyssinian wheat here, Fox Kestrel, and some really impressive views out over the valley. Um, that's the Gemma Valley. Uh, we also look for white winged cliff chats, uh, which occur near the, the Franklin spots. A little rock thrush occur here too. Before we make our way further, further east still to around uh, Deborah Behan and beyond, uh, this is the Ankaba area where we look for the um, Ankaba siren. So this bird was only very recently discovered, I believe in the 1980s. And um, although hardly a, what you describe as a beautiful looking bird, it is extremely range restricted and um, can be quite tough to pick out in these uh, in the high on street grasslands. We then go down in altitude to the Malka Gebdu area, and this is where we where we search the dry river beds for the other throated sparrow, particularly in the heat of day when birds come down to drink. And uh, we also look for yellow breasted barbets in the acacia woodlands, uh, beautiful barbets, sorry, beautiful sunbird, uh, northern carmine bee eaters. Before heading across to the Awash National Park area, and the Aladege Plains. So this photograph here is birding in the Aladege Plains, uh, probably looking at Arabian Bustard or Somali Ostrich. 
and uh, we, we also look out for Abyssinian roller in the uh, nearby woodlands and uh, the, the heat here can be sweltering so you really need to get here at sunrise and bird uh, before the, the heat haze just becomes too much. Uh, also have good numbers of animals in the area such as Biza oryx, Summering's gazelle, uh, there's golden jackals around too and Grevy's zebra can be seen as well. And then perhaps more in a washed national park which is a little bit south of Aladega Plains. We search for a number of, of bustards, so white-bellied bustards, um, buff-crested bustards, as well as uh, a number of antelope species. And there are actually free-ranging lion here, but that can be very tough to see. After a day's birding, a long day's birding, we head out and do some, to do some nocturnal birding, looking for owls and nightjars, with the big target being star-spotted nightjar. After finishing up in a wash, we head a little bit west uh, down to the um, to the Rift Valley. But before that, we stop um, we stop in an area of um, where, we, where we search for somber rock chat, and it's a really impressive area where it occurs. It's, it's these odd, um, I believe, basalt um, basalt fields with little patches of acacia woodlands in between. And this is where the somber rock chat occurs. So not as hardly a spectacular looking bird, but extremely range restricted. So once we got, have gone through Langano area, we then head up to Dinshu. Um, so Langano is in the Rift Valley and that's where we search for things such as um, um, or yellow fronted parrots. We also go for Abyssinian ground hornbill. Uh, von der Decken's hornbill, and we search for forest patches for Norena trogon. And then this, this shot here is uh, the juniper forest up in uh, Dinshu, where these, the game guards or the scouts often know where roosting Abyssinian owls occur, as well as African wood owl, uh, little brown woodland warblers, Abyssinian ground thrush, and there's a few antelope around too, such as mountain yala, uh, menex bushbuck, uh, boho reedbuck, and in the more open areas, the impressive thick board raven. We then head up to the uh, Saneti Plateau, um, which is over 4,000 meters high, and um, it's really an impressive area and often the highlight of any Ethiopian birding tour. Um, you get these giant lobelias uh, in, occurring in the, the moorland, and uh, we, we basically, the big target here is Ethiopian wolf. But there's a, a number of birding highlights too, such as, such as Rougette's rail, spot breasted lapwing, and the big target is Ethiopian wolf, which, um, which predates on the large numbers of rodents in the area. We, we quickly shoot down to Herena Forest, where we search for a number of any forest species we may be missing, maybe Abyssinian catbird. And then we head back through the Rift Valley and then down to the Negele area, where we look for Rispoli's Taraco. This is often the bird of a trip for um, on any Ethiopian birding tour. But we then head further south still through the Laban Plain or onto the Laban Plain where we search for Archer's Lock before making our way and this is Archer's Lock uh, thanks to Alessandro Aldero for supplying me with photographs and uh, heading further south is a picture of Garrett Skeeds. This is the Abello area where we search for big target of Streesman's bush crow and white-tailed swallow. But of course, we look for things like Juba weaver, Somali corsa in the general area. This is the bush crow. We then make our way back up to the Rift Valley, where we, um, we bird some of the lakes and the forest patches for things like gray-backed fiscal, black-winged lovebird, blue-breasted beta. And then we head up to Giva Gorge, where we search for red bull partilia, bar-breasted five-inch, Western black headed batters and anything else we may, be, we may be missing before finishing up in Addis Ababa. Um, and then, of course, any Ethiopian tour would not be complete without talking about the, the culture and the history. So, this is uh, the rock hewn churches of Lalibela, and this is St. George's Church. And there's some really fantastic scenes in the area for anyone who has an interest in culture and history. I mean, just to finish to talk very briefly about um, the, the company I work for, Birding Eco Tours. So uh, we specialize in small group and custom made birding and, and wildlife tours. Um, so whether you're joining us on an African trip to Ethiopia 
or to or to Uganda, where we search for shoebill, perhaps looking for snow petrel and uh, possibly even emperor penguin on the Antarctic cruise, or of into the neotropics, where we bird the Andes for things like diadend sandpiper plover, um, as well as birding in the in Australasia. So whether it's um, Papua New Guinea um, for birds of paradise or um, parrots and cassowaries. Uh, please do join us. We'd love to have you along and uh, please get in touch. Thanks for listening. Good day, folks. Welcome to the African Bird Fair. Um, it's Mark Cronier here from uh, Nature Travel Birding. And I'm going to be talking to you this afternoon or this morning about Ghana, West Africa's golden child. Just a little bit about myself. I'm a bird guide for a birding company called Nature Travel Birding. We offer birding tours across uh, South Africa, Southern Africa, Africa and the world. And um, yeah, have a look. We are exhibiting at the fair, at this virtual birding fair where this uh, corona pandemic has been a bit different. So please just have a look at our stand. You can see some of the tours that we offer. We offer tours, as you heard me say, I mean, we offer tours literally anywhere in the world. So have a look, see at our tours that we offer, get in touch with us, join us on social media, follow us, and I hope you enjoy my tour on Ghana. About me, I've been a bird guide now for just about uh, six years. Do all my birding, my, my guiding for nature travel birding. And yeah, just absolutely love sharing my passion for birding, watching birds, and enjoying being out in nature and just appreciating the small things. So on to Ghana. Ghana, West Africa's golden child. It is literally that. You can even just see from this cover photo. It's a fantastic country. The rock being in this West African primary tropical rainforest is just every time I go there, it's absolutely just amazing. The scenery we come across throughout the trip, being in the forest, some of the fantastic birds we see. Yeah, it's just absolutely amazing. Ghana itself, it's a country very, very rich in culture and history. We know a little bit about the history from the slave trade. And on the tour, we do go via the Cape um, Coast Castle. And it is a stark reminder of um, some of the terrible things that happened in the past and how the slave trade was rife in Ghana. And a lot of these slaves would have been kept in the squad now as a tourist attraction, but kept in these horrific conditions, loaded onto the boats and then shipped across to other parts of the world where they were kept as slaves. So that culture, that history is there. In my opinion, the people in Ghana are some of the most friendliest people in Africa. It's just an amazing country to travel. Friendly people, really, really good infrastructure, easy to get along. Everybody speaks English, hassle-free, travel, excellent infrastructure. It's politically stable. There's no civil war going on. So it's a perfect country to travel to if you want to experience birding in, in, in West Africa. It's actually fun to a joke and they call it Africa for beginners. We're looking at connecting with some of these great um, birds that we get in West Africa. Definitely Ghana is the place to do it. Apart from the great birding, there's some fantastic scenery, which you're going to see now throughout my presentation, some great wildlife. We make a stop at the butterfly sanctuary. So we enjoy some great unique butterflies from the forest. And the guides are just exceptional. The guides we use, they really, really know what they're doing. We just, just makes for an impressive 14 day tour. We really just enjoy everything we come across. Just some of the things, I mean, um, Ghana has got 180 of the Guinea Congo forest biome birds. And of that, 12 of the 15 upper Guinea forest endemics can be found in Ghana. In Ghana. So it really is a, a trip you need to do and a trip for those that are trying to get connect with these um, more sought after or difficult species. Ghana is the place to do it. Some of these upper Guinea forest endemics we can get on our trips in Uganda, but a lot more easy to get in Ghana. Ghana's got a bird list of just over 800 species. So you can, yeah, we really, really enjoy some fantastic birding when we're on this trip in Ghana. So just to give an idea where we are, so you heard me say Ghana is in West Africa. So you can see on the map there in the top corner of Africa. And then you can see it's bordered by Tonga and Benin on the right, and then Cote d'Ivoire there on the left. And then those yellow spots, you can just see where we go. So we start flying to the capital, Accra, which is on the coast move along the coast to the Cape Coast, then we head inland to our first stop into the forest, and then we head slightly north up to Molay National Park. And some fantastic birding in Molay. Molay is typical open grassland birding, a little bit of wetlands, and uh, some fantastic Forbes plover grasshopper buzzard when I was there in January was very, very common, which for us down here in South Africa is always a very, very rare bird, up there very, very common. 
but yeah, some really, really great birding to be had. So just some of the special birds that we come across on this tour. Everyone knows Ghana. Almost when we think of birding in Ghana, this, um, the Picathartes, your white-necked rockfowl, rockfowl or the Picathartes is definitely a bird that comes to mind. And we do go off to the Picathartes site, to the rockfowl site, walk up and we do enjoy spectacular views of this uh, great, really odd uh, sort of the bird. And of course, by going through and supporting this project, uh, we are supporting the local community that's involved in protecting the Pick Authority site and protecting the birds. So we try to do an hour on our tours, also try and do some conservation work, and we do a lot of work with the local communities on the ground. And you can see um, Ghana and West Africa. Africa is very, very famous for its barbets. And one of the great barbets that we come across, or sort of the birds that we come across on this tour, is your bearded barbet. Yeah, you can see we were lucky we really got some exceptional views of this great bird another another family of birds that um is that makes africa famous are our bee eaters and this is one of the sort of the bee eaters in west africa and in ghana this is your blue moustache bee eater but once we visited the butterfly sanctuary in the morning we head up to a bit of a bit of a walk and we head up to nice altitude and this is where we come across this absolutely stunning avian gem and then one of the other great birds that I managed to connect with on my recent trip to Ghana was a Congo Serpent Eagle, also one of our main uh, targets for the trip in, in Ghana. Of course, a chance while we're spending time in East Africa, in Ghana, coming across in Central Africa, but we were very, very lucky we actually had this bird perched and sitting like this. For me, a great bird to finally connect with. And then another bird that is famous when people talk about birding in Ghana, this Egyptian plover is a bird that often comes to mind. And for me, every time I come across this bird, it's just such a fantastic looking bird that it's, yeah, it's always one of the highlights of our tour to Ghana. When we leave Malay National Park in the north to make a detour to go and find this bird, and it's, yeah, we've been lucky, touch wood, we always find these guys and they are just, yeah, fantastic birds. Another great aspect of birding in West Africa and in Ghana is the night birding, the owls we get to enjoy. We do spend time going out at night looking for owls and looking for night jars. And this is a Fraser's Eagle Owl that we photographed on one of my previous tours. We do also come across a Kun Eagle Owl quite often. And there you can see another special bird of uh, Ghana. This is a mangrove sunbird. There's only one locality in Ghana which you know of, these bir of this bird. And we make a detour and we go off and we see this bird and we're very, very lucky. We often get some great views of the species. One of the forest specials of Ghana, this was taken in Kankum National Park. And this is your uh, Western Bearded Green Bull. Also, I mean, guys will know we get the Eastern Bearded Green Bull in Uganda. And this is the special one you see in the forest in uh, West Africa. And then the Taraka is another family of birds which is famous in, makes Africa famous. We know down here in South Africa, we get the Nisner Taraka, we get Livingston's Taraka. Purple Crest, the Taraka, as we move up into Africa, West Africa, we get some very, very impressive Taraka. So this is one of the famous Tarakas from Ghana. This is your yellow billed Taraka. And some of the other Tarakas we see on the trip are your violet Taraka. And then the absolutely stunning great blue Taraka. And then, yeah, that's a night jar. This is a standard wing night jar. This was taken in uh, Malay National Park. And also an absolutely fantastic bird to just come across. South Africans will be familiar with a pennant wing night jar that we see around Punda Maria in Kruger National Park on our trips that we lead in Kruger and up north for that some fantastic birding within South Africa. And when you see this standard wing night jar, the pennants on this thing, it's also very, very, very impressive to see. And then one of the other great birds we target on the trip, this is your Oriole Warbler. Absolutely fantastic bird. Can be a real sulker from fun some time to time. But sometimes we do get them lucky coming down to drink like this. And then another sort of the bird on the trip. It looks like a three-banded plover, but it's not. This is your Forbes plover. And when we spend time up in Malay National Park, this is one of the main targets that we're looking for when we're in the park. That's just a quick or a brief outline of some of the top birds you can expect on a trip to Ghana. It's impossible in a short amount of time to really do it any justice and go through the whole tour. So again, check out our store that we have at this virtual bird fair. Find us on the Facebook, join us on social media, Nature Travel Birding, or our website. And you'll see on that website, we've got a, a good amount of information 
more and more in detail about the tours we offer in Africa and across the world. Just some of the top attractions in Ghana. So this you can see is the aerial walkway in um, Cancun National Park. This walkway is quite famous amongst birders and no trip to Ghana is complete. We're spending at least a morning or afternoon and most of the time another morning on this walkway. It's great because you're high up in the canopy on the top of the canopy. So we have the birds literally at eye level. I mean, you have, it's fantastic. You have the Malumbis moving around. You have the bearded green bulls, the Nikotors, um, Western Nikotor. You have these great birds. Uh, the Makoa is just moving beautiful at eye level where you get some great views on them. That is some of the scenery in Molay National Park. You can see the African elephants down there enjoying the wetland. It's our chance where you do enjoy some of the wildlife on Opa. We saw a West African genet on a night drive. We um, come across a variety of different antelopes. So it really just adds, makes the trip all worthwhile and just adds a good amount of variety. You can see it's quite a mixture of bush felt and then a good amount of open grassland in Molay as well. And then you can see this is us enjoying some of the primary forest that's available in West Africa. And here you can see we're in, we're in, the, we're in the Atara Forest Reserve and we just spent time in Atara Forest Reserve, just really enjoying some of the great birding that's often. Sometimes we're on the outskirts of forest, that's where we saw that Congo serpent eagle coming in, things like thick-billed cuckoo flying over us. And then you can imagine some of the sort of the apalaces, acolytes, etc., also found in this forest. And then another great forest, we actually spent time camping in this. This is your Ankasa National Park. We spent two nights camping in Ankasa National Park. The camp is all set up when we get there. And this national park has got some exceptionally great, um, this is where we get a lot of those Upper Guinea forest endemics coming in. It's great, special, special bird that we go out at night and find in this forest is in Kugulengi Rail. We, get, we had exceptional views on, the last, on, on our last trip of this bird in the trees. Also white-bellied kingfisher and blue-breasted kingfisher we see in this, in this park. We had African foot, African, uh, foot, foot in the river, so you can imagine some great birding on offer in Nkasa National Park. And then, like all tours, we do spend time eating, not too much time eating. We focus mainly on the birding. But that's just to give an idea of some of the typical cuisine we enjoy while we're out and about birding in Ghana. They've got some great beer, club beer potentially some of the best beer in Africa. So after we've had a great day's birding and we're doing our listing, it's always good to enjoy a, a club. And then there you can just see my last group when we were out there in Ghana birding, us just enjoying. You can see all the smiles, everyone's very, very happy. We had just come down now from uh, seeing the yellow, the, the Picathati. So you can imagine once you come across that rock pile and you see that rock pile like that, that white neck rock pile, it's just, a, it's just that's a special bird and you can see the thumbs up and all the smiles from, from enjoying that trip and seeing that bird so fantastically like that. You can see our two guides there who led us through this trip, did an amazing job and got us onto some fantastic birds. And then you can see I've just put this up um, just to give you our links to some of our, uh, so you can join us on social media and you can find us, find, find I'm just moving my screen so you can find us. So we've got a Facebook page, Nature Travel Birding. We are also on Instagram and then our website. And you can also, I have put down my personal from my personal Facebook there. And then just a contact um, address and as well, info at naturetravelbirding.com. But you heard me say we are exhibiting at the bird fair, at this virtual bird fair. Huge congrats to BirdLife, guys. You've done an amazing work, you know, with this whole COVID and what's been happening, you've really stepped it up by taking the bird fair virtually well done um, it's really impressive i'm so glad that nature travel birding we're a part of it and yeah come across check it out check us out see our stand see what we've got to offer and yeah keep enjoying the birds and just thanks for giving me your time learning a bit about ghana like you heard me say this little 10 minutes doesn't really do it justice but yeah ghana if you're into forest birding you want to see some of those special birds in west africa definitely put ghana on your wish list Thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your bird fair, and I really, really hope to see you soon on tour. Bye for now. Thank you to Johnny, John, Etienne, Michael, Dominic, and Mark for those presentations. I hope that you're fired up now for some African birding. Our second shorter session on African birding destinations is at 1 p.m. on this main feeder. Coming up next, however, is a special session run by the Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology. 
12 students at the FITS will be presenting on their current work. We're privileged in Africa to have an institute as incredible as the FITS on our continent, and we look forward to hearing about the latest in bird research. At 11.30 at FIDA 2, we have a recap of BirdLife South Africa's six conservation programs and their work. And on FIDA 3, a session on inspiring new and young African birders began at 11 o'clock. Please don't forget to pop into our exhibitor booths to engage with our many participants and also to go bid on all of our silent auction items.